let's talk about high flow nasal cannula. Now this is something that has traditionally been upstairs in the ICU, but many emergency departments are starting to see this therapy, as well as some inpatient wards in the hospital. What is it? Well, high flow provides flows of greater than 20 liters per minute, and in some devices, up to 60 liters per minute. That's a lot of flow, but it's that amount of flow that creates the magic of what high flow does. Now, just for the basis of this discussion, realize that high flow is only helpful for people who have a type one or hypoxemic respiratory failure. Do you need to brush up on your type one or type two problems? Go back to CritBit season one with the video that's linked up here and check out that video. And while you're at it, why don't you go ahead and like this video and hit the subscribe bell if you enjoy what you see. So let's get on with the rest of this discussion. As you'd imagine, this therapy is administered by nasal cannula and not just your standard nasal cannula that you see patients getting on the ward. These nasal cannula have large bore and that's going to facilitate the high rates of flow that's going through these cannula. There's a couple different ways that high flow can help your patients. The first way is it's heated and humidified. It also provides a lot of oxygen to the patients. And lastly, it provides a lot of flow. And this flow is going to help with generating some positive end expiratory pressure, as well as washing out some dead space. We're going to go through each one of these now. If you think 60 liters per minute would dry out the nasal mucosa and be very uncomfortable for patients, you'd be right. And that's why high flow is both heated and humidified so that the nasal mucosa won't become dried out and develop epistaxis. It turns out that there's also some other benefits about being heated and humidified. And one of them is that it improves mucus clearance. Patients who have upper respiratory and lower respiratory infections tend to develop thick, dense mucus. And providing heated and humidified air, this breaks it up and improves mucus clearance for these patients. This can be a really good thing if you're trying to keep your patients extubated. And because there's nothing covering up the person's mouth, such as non-invasive ventilation, they're able to cough and spit this out easily or use suction. So that's the first way that high flow nasal cannula is beneficial for the patients. The second way is providing lots of oxygen. And for this, I'm gonna give you a patient example. Let's just say we have a patient who's in respiratory distress. Let's just say they have a pneumonia and they're breathing at a rate of 45 breaths per minute. And they're taking a tidal volume of about 400 cc's per breath. That's gonna be a minute ventilation of 18 liters per minute. Well, let's see what happens when we put a person on a non-rebreather mask, a pretty traditional way of supplying oxygen to our patients. Now let's look at two scenarios. The first scenario is when we have a patient on a non-rebreather, a rate that's gonna be about 15 liters per minute, and we have the person who's on high flow nasal cannula, and we'll say we start them at 30 liters per minute. In the first example here, and yes, that's a nose, the person is trying to pull 18 liters per minute for their minute ventilation. As you can see, the person is breathing 18 liters per minute, but the mask is providing 15 liters a minute. That means that in addition to the pure oxygen that's being provided here, some ambient oxygen is being pulled in as well because this person is outpacing what the non-rebreather mask can provide. In other words, their minute ventilation is greater than the flow that's provided by the non-rebreather mask. With high flow at 30 liters per minute, the person is getting their their FiO2, their oxygen, and the high flow is staying ahead of what the person's demands are. And that means that the oxygen that the person is getting is closer to the FiO2 that you set. It's not diluted by the room air because the person is not pulling in extra room air. The flow is only provided by the high flow nasal cannula. I hope that makes sense. But in summary, what high flow does is it meets the patient's minute ventilation better because it has higher flows and you get less entrainment or less room air oxygen getting pulled and diluting down the FiO2. And so the FiO2 that you dial in on the high flow machine is much closer to the FiO2 that the patient is getting. In this example, you would think that the person's getting 100% FiO2, but because the room air is getting diluted down, they're probably getting a lot less than that. Here, if you dial in 100%, you can be sure that your patient's getting 100%. And as you scale down your FiO2, you can be assured that the patient is accurately getting what's dialed in on the machine because there's no entrainment of room air. Okay, let's go on to the next concept. Now the next bit, it's a little bit controversial and there isn't agreement in the literature, but because you're providing so much flow for this patient, you're actually generating some positive end expiratory pressure. Now how much end expiratory pressure? No one really knows. You'll read literature that says anywhere from one centimeter of water all the way up to eight centimeters of water. And the reason why the literature is all over the place is because a lot of this depends on the patient's physiology. It depends on their upper airway structures. It depends on their body habitus. It depends if the patient's keeping their mouth closed. Yes, to generate PEEP, 
and the benefits of high flow, the patient has to keep their mouth closed. So this flow goes into the nasopharynx and generates that pressure. So what I normally like to say is that if you have somebody that needs a lot of positive end expiratory pressure, this is not the mode that you want to use. But if you have somebody who can't tolerate the mask, who just needs a little bit of positive end expiratory pressure, then give this a try. In fact, I'm known for saying that this is kind of like diet CPAP or CPAP light because you can't generate the same amount of pressures as you do with CPAP as you can with this. But if you need a little peep and you're somewhere in this range, I go for this first. And just for completeness, as we said in the type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure video from before, this is not going to clear out CO2 in a sufficient amount for your patients who have a pure type 2 respiratory failure. So if you have someone who has a COPD exacerbation, this is not going to ventilate your patients very effectively. The last thing I want to say about high flow is it does help wash out CO2 in the dead space. When you have patients who are so tachypnic, they're not adequately getting those tidal volumes all the way down to the distal alveoli. They're taking rapid breaths, sometimes they're shallow, so there is a fair amount of CO2 that's just moving back and forth between the lower respiratory tract and the trachea, and then back down again. This is known as dead space, and this is not effective ventilation. What high flow does is because of the flows, it washes out CO2 in the upper airways and causes diffusion of CO2 from these lower spaces up to the upper air spaces and allows that CO2 to, to clear out much better. Essentially, this is helping to patients to ventilate a little bit better. How much? We're not really sure. This is not something that you're going to use for someone with the dense COPD exacerbation, but this can help with CO2 clearance, and this is going to make the patient's work of breathing a little bit easier. So again, just to summarize this point, the high flow washes out CO2, making patients breathing more efficient and improving the patient's dead space ventilation. Okay, we went over a lot, so it's probably best that we summarize things, but I hardly have any paper left. High flow nasal cannula is a therapy that you're gonna use for patients with a type one respiratory problem. It's gonna help with oxygenation. It's heated and humidified, which helps with patient comfort, but also helps with the mucociliary clearance and helps people get the junk out of their airway. It provides very titratable oxygen for your patients. And remember, a person who's in respiratory distress is going to have a minute ventilation that's gonna be faster than what the standard wall oxygen can supply. But by using high flow, you're able to keep up with the person's needs and you're able to give them the FiO2 that they actually need without bringing in some of the room air and diluting down that FiO2. High flow also provides some positive and expiratory pressure. Don't be expecting as much as you get with traditional CPAP, but this can be helpful. And remember, the patient has to keep their mouth closed. And finally, for patients who are really tachypnic, they can have a lot of CO2 building up and have more dead space ventilation. Well, the high flow can help wash out that CO2 and make their breathing much more efficient. You know what? I just forgot one more thing. This is also a great therapy for patients who have a do not intubate order or for patients who are palliative care. This provides oxygen support, provides a little bit of ventilatory support, but it allows patients to eat, drink, communicate with families. It's a much more humane way for patients to get therapy without putting a tight fitting mask. It allows them to have a better quality of time with their families. It is just a much more humane way of taking care of your patients. So don't forget about high flow for these categories of patients as well. All right, that's what I got for you for high flow nasal cannula. If there's something I forgot or something that you'd like like to add to this crit bits, please comment below and I'll be sure to respond and maybe include it on a future video. Stay awesome everyone.